European um, Council on Foreign Relations. And um, I, uh, I lead the European Power Programme and Kerala Cross Programmatic Work on Climate. And I have great pleasure to chair this discussion today um, with um, two brilliant colleagues who know far more about the subject than I do. Um, Sebastian Treya, who is the Executive Director of IDRI, and Guamaka Kefukwe, who is my, one of my newest colleagues at ECFR, um, a research fellow in our Africa programme. So I'm going to um, abuse my position as chair uh, by starting off our discussion today about influencing the Green Deal um, by making a few comments um, on the geopolitical context in which this is all taking place in. Um, so bear with me while I share my screen with you. Uh, hopefully now um, you can all see my screen as well as hear me. Um, and I should say, I should have said um, in my introductions before, what we're going to do um, is um, each of us uh, on, on the panel are going to make um, a few short comments and then we will open up uh, the floor for uh, Q&A. Um, just to say, as we're in webinar format, I can't give the floor um, to others, but what I can do um, is encourage you strongly, as of now, to write any questions that you have in the Q&A box, um, and then we can pick them up uh, and, and discuss them further. So we're really looking forward uh, to interacting with you in that way. So, um, as I said, I want to start off with a few comments about the geopolitical context for the implementation of the Green Deal. And I wanted to draw on a new product that we've just launched um, at the end of the last year at ECFR called the Power Atlas. Essentially, what we've tried to do with this project is use open source data to lay out how some of the um, mega trends that we're seeing in the world today are shifting the dynamics of power and try to draw in each of the different thematic areas um, uh, what we can we understand to be the new power map. Um, so I'm going to be obviously be talking to you about the way in which um, that climate and climate change and um, the inevitability now um, of the need for the world to transition away from carbon is shifting uh, power dynamics relating to Europe. Um, first of all, um, I think uh, it's uh, it, it's important to say that there are um, the, the different states are being affected unequally. Um, we can see. Um, uh, first of all, that um, there is a very rapidly changing reality um, for, uh, uh, for, for the petrol producing states, um, but they're not all as well placed as each other to cope with the transition. Um, I think that what we're, what we're um, seeing coming um, in, in very, very quickly now um, is, is a far greater impact on, um, on those states which are producing um, uh, carbon based fuels at higher cost. Um, and uh, we, we're seeing um, uh, an increasing need for dialogue about the future uh, of fuel uh, with, with con consumer states um, in, in those energy relationships uh, for, for these states. We're also seeing um, uh, that uh, there, there are unequal impacts on different states in terms of vulnerability um, to climate change. What I'm showing you here um, is a map which draws on the Notre Dame Gain um, Index, uh, looking at vulnerability to climate change and readiness to adapt. And as you can see from this map, um, a lot of the um, OECD countries um, are far less, far less vulnerable in this sense um, than, um, than developing countries, which is also shaping um, uh, the, the, the conversations um, around um, climate. Uh, a, a, a second sort of measure um, of this vulnerability question is in terms of um, uh, uh, the, the, the vulnerability to, um, to global warming itself. And as you can see again um, on, on this map, which looks uh, specifically uh, at, uh, at, at, at cooling demand uh, in a warmer world, um, again, it's, 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 it's a similar split, split between um, OECD countries um, and the developing world particularly um, being uh, more vulnerable. Finally, um, in terms of natural resources to manage um, the transition away from carbon, um, I wanted to flag um, the unequal uh, uh, impact here um, of the need to transition. Um, and I think that this starts to bring us into the conversation about how Europe can manage um, uh, uh, its own implementation of the ambitions set out under the European Green Deal and the extent to which we will be very dependent um, on partnerships, um, particularly with um, those countries uh, closest to us, uh, but not only um, in terms of implementing these ambitions. 
we, we will never get to a point where we can guarantee our own energy security within Europe, although, as you can see, we have um, some uh, uh, good potential, particularly when it comes to wind um, capacity. Uh, but um, in terms of building up our solar potential, partnerships are going to be absolutely critical for us here. And also in terms of access to um, uh, the raw materials needed, particularly rare earths and lithium, uh, for a lot of the technologies uh, which uh, are going to be nece necessary to, um, to building this transition, um, uh, our, our trade relationships um, are going to be key. So in this environment where um, everybody's circumstances are chi um, shifting, we're seeing a number of different types of climate power being exercised at the moment. Uh, within um, the chapter in, in the Power Atlas, we characterize this in sort of three rough routes. One is being around um, economic climate power, how you use your trade uh, relationships, um, your energy relationships and so on, um, in order to drive the transition forward. One being resource um, climate power. Um, so this is very much about uh, what, uh, what, what materials do you have available to you in order to push the transition forward. And one being about diplomatic climate power. And I think um, that uh, very briefly, what I would like to put forward um, is that we're seeing uh, Europe um, becoming, um, uh, showing great ambition in terms of exercising diplomatic climate power, but not yet being at the stage where it is effectively using the potential of economic um, uh, climate power within this. Um, and I think, you know, some of the examples um, that we've seen uh, recently in terms of the challenges of doing this have been sort of Europeans being unprepared to cope with the negative backlash against the, car the proposal for the carbon border adjustment mechanism. Um, but I think also a sort of a lack of clear signaling in external relationships, as we've seen in the um, recent proposal um, from the Commission uh, around uh, green taxonomy, what will count as um, clean sources of energy for future investment. Um, I think that uh, the, the, um, our, our inability at the moment um, as Europeans to come together around these decisions and communicate that clearly to partners is limiting um, our ability to drive, um, uh, drive forward uh, climate leadership at a European level. But um, as I said, this is, this is clearly something that we not only should do um, if we want to fulfill the ambition to become a global um, uh, green leader, but also something um, which is necessary for us to do. European states are at very different starting points when it comes to um, uh, the, the, the current share of uh, renewable energy uh, within um, uh, member states' energy mixes. Um, but uh, we have got a lot of uh, work to do at home um, uh, in order to push that forward. And that's going to depend um, on, on, our, our, on, on, on the partnerships around us. So I'm going to, um, uh, to stop here in, in terms of my, um, my opening thoughts all of, uh, on all of this. Um, and I'd like to turn um, now uh, to, to my colleagues for, for their reactions and um, uh, their takes. Uh, in terms of uh, in, in, in terms of uh, how they see Europe uh, in this environment, um, Sebastian, maybe if I could, um, I would come to you first of all. Um, I'd be really interested to, um, to 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 hear how you see European climate leadership um, after um, COP26. How, how how do you think we're doing at managing um, the, the 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 challenges internally and externally, and the links between that um, in implementation of the European Green Deal? Thank you very much, Susie, and thank you for ECFR for inviting me. It's always a pleasure to, uh, I mean, you've put a, a panorama that is extremely uh, useful to think about the, the, the future of power relations in the net zero thinking that I think COP26 was also in starting. Uh, we still need to believe in it, but this is a possible scenario that we need to really look at. Um, I, and, and, I, and I think really the uh, European Green Deal is a, is a very important statement, uh, both on climate and biodiversity. And I would, I would like to come back to that because this is, I think, uh, Europe is, has done a job with the European Green Deal to really have a, both a, an ambition on climate and biodiversity that is not, that you don't have an equal type of ambition in other regions. And I think that is putting a lot of pressure on internal negotiations in Europe, more than in other, on, on specific sectors like uh, agri-food, particularly important uh, pressure on this sector within Europe. And that makes it difficult as a negotiation domestically, but then also 
uh, it could give some leverage for championship, for being a champion of something in the years to come, particularly because we are still ahead of COP15 COP on biodiversity, where there is no champion for the moment. China is not playing the role of a champion as a presidency. And I think there is something behind the, 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 the French insistence on that and the German insistence on that, where we should at least during the short time of active uh, uh, political leadership of the French presidency of the European Union to push for showing uh, more diplomacy, more championship on these issues. But as you said, it needs to, that necessitates that there is enough um, uh, coherence between the negotiation we need to have internally and what we can negotiate with other parts of the world. And this is extremely, a very complicated uh, diplomatic uh, issue. I just, before getting into this, this is the complexness of, of very important uh, elements of those internal external relations that you've already pointed at i just wanted to say that europe is is not easily going to be a champion for, for, for various reasons so the green deal is important but europe cannot do as always claim to be the champion because of its virtue because other regions do not believe the virtue of europe and they want to see if europe delivers that's the first one second europe has was paradoxically not a champion at, at COP26 because it had done the job way too early uh, with, with in 2019 on, on announcing the Green Deal, uh, already uh, mid-2020 on explaining how the Green Deal is going to be implemented through a series of laws, and also even on, on financing, uh, on, on climate finance, Europe had substituted the lack of finance from the US on the Greek Climate Fund, but that was already 2019, 2020. So Europe came to COP26 with no new announcement to make. And, and, and for being a champion, you need to have something to announce. And the visibility of the US-China uh, pact at, uh, at in Glasgow was very important, although it was in terms of concrete action, it was much less important than what Europe had done. Uh, and also, if you want to be able to negotiate something on uh, du during the COPs, then you need to still need to not have done everything before. So this is a, this was a paradoxical thing that you, we needed Europe to be the, uh, the early mover because that enabled others to come afterwards. But then it made Europe quite weak in terms of political leverage at COP26. And I think we need to reflect on how that can be changed uh, in terms of uh, being present at COP15 and COP26. Uh, just, just to be clear, I insist on Europe being very ambitious on biodiversity because this matters for biodiversity, that at least a, a region is, is, is taking that stance. I don't believe that for the moment this has a political importance globally. It's a lot of discourse. It's not really in the real economy of tomorrow. Companies do not really see what is, but maybe in the agri-food sector, but other companies do not see what is in the biodiversity transition that would really matter for them. But I think nevertheless that Europe should has to play that leadership on biodiversity because no other country is going to do that. And by doing so, it puts more difficulties to their own negotiation because being both climate and biodiversity positive is, is even more complicated. So I wanted to point at some risks and some opportunities for Europe in the years to come. Uh, in the year to come, I would say the month to come, uh, precisely linking internal and external discussions. Uh, first, of course, as I said, Europe is going to be scrutinized for its credibility. Europe is going to be distrusted. There is a lot, a, a, a strong amount of distrust from uh, southern countries, I would say, but at the same time expected. So trying to, Europe, other countries tell us they want Europe to be the champion, but they don't believe us and they don't trust us. So this is a complex uh, situation. Um, so first, of course, we need to deliver to do the job on the Green Deal internally. This is crucial for credibility, but that's, that will necessitate a lot of uh, very complex internal negotiation between the sectors and between the member states. And a lot of the focus of Mr. T of Vice President Timmermans is for the moment, of course, I mean, naturally, uh, very focused on internal politics rather than linking the internal politics with the international politics. And that's a very complex game to be, to be played. You've mentioned a few of the files and I want to really put the emphasis on some of them that are going to be critical. And I think a lot are on the plate of the French presidency. The French presidency, as I said, will be only active politically before uh, the election period. So that makes three months of active uh, political work. That is not enough, but maybe internationally, a lot of the diplomatic consequences can be still prepared or anticipated during the three last months of the, uh, between uh, April and June of the, of the French presidency. First, I want to say that 
there are, as you said, the, the carbon border adjustment mechanism that is a, a very, a very complex issue uh, for the moment. Uh, if we obtain the internal agreement within Europe through a kind of a free allocation for some of the sectors, this will completely jeopardize the credibility of what we do and then only present Europe as a protectionist power. And of course, there is also the issue of the dynamics. For the moment, the European Commission is saying, no, no, but it's only a few sectors. But all the other countries expect that in time, other sectors will be aggregated. So the middle, the, the higher middle, the lower middle income countries of Africa or other, other regions are saying, for the moment, we are not uh, the sectors that you are going to to, uh, to apply the CBAM to are not the sectors that we export to Europe. But, but what what in five years from now? What in ten years from now? This is a very important discussion, and and uh, we really need to take to to be careful about that. You mentioned the taxonomy, and we have Indian colleagues who are telling us what you do on sustainable finance is extremely important for us. Not only on gas being included or not, which would be really a nightmare when we try to 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 explain to other countries that gas should not be uh, only there on, on a derogatory manner part of the transition pathway, uh, but on, also on how the sustainable finance principle decided in Europe might prevent Indian uh, companies to access uh, capital in the international level. That is really a concern that we need to deal with. I, I could mention also the farm to fork discussion uh, and the way that it links to uh, the conditions for having the, the French FNSR, the Farmers Union, accept the farm to fork is really linked to borders condition outside of Europe. And that is a complex negotiation that we are still, is not really clear for the moment linked to the CBAM. Uh, but I also want to mention, because it's linked to one of your maps, we need to think also of the fact that Europe wants to capture the industrial value chains of the net zero economy for the jobs, the added value and the power. But this is exactly where colleagues from Africa are telling us, okay, but don't just think about how in the race between the US, China and Europe, you can capture the most of the jobs, because we also need to have our share of that, particularly when we are exporting to new raw materials. And that negotiation, I think, is ill for the moment, quite ill prepared for the EU-AU summit, even though the event on trade with uh, organized by France clearly stated at least that this was an issue, that the supply chains of the economy of tomorrow need to be balanced between not just trying to capture everything here in Europe, but needed to be balanced. Uh, and I just wanted to mention, and I know that time is running, uh, there are also things that Europe decides for itself that are going to be setting an atmosphere for the rest of the world. I mean, the CBAM is not just about how we, uh, it's about doctrine, about the economic structure, uh, the, the, the regulation of the economic of, of globalization. And as you say, being an economic, uh, uh, the economic climate diplomacy is extremely important. Uh, the way also we are going to question or not the stability pact is also about how we see the doctrine of uh, monetary policy, etc. And that is also looked at in the rest of the world. Um, so these, these are a, a lot of elements that are going to be import, very, very important. I just wanted to mention that, of course, the delivery on aid promises on financing the rest of the world is also going to be very important. For the moment, uh, the asymmetry of what we do for internal recovery and, and the, 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 the very the much, much smaller amounts of money that we transfer to southern countries, this asymmetry is extremely critical. And we need to prepare for the fact that actually Europe could also much more uh, play the role of saying we have a vision for uh, aligning recovery with Agenda 2030, the way that we also need to, the way we implement uh, recovery and alignment with Agenda 2030 is also linked to democratic processes, to the way participation enables to think of the alignment of recovery with green and uh, green and social. And so there are lots of things, that, a discourse that needs to be not just trapped into the lack of money, but be rather an opportunity for Europe to to take, to take a, a space in, in globalization. So I end here just to say that some deals, like the deals that uh, were, were struck with ESCOM, the South African electricity company, are probably the type of deals that Europe wants to strike further. So you take a small type of problem, public and private, you could have a, a similar idea on steel or cement, where uh, uh, it's not just about transferring money from northern countries to southern countries, but also having a deal with a company, etc. This seems quite good in terms of pragmatism, but is, is also very much scrutinized by southern countries for the risk of uh, unfair 
uh, or a balance of power when you strike those deals that are club deals. And I yeah. think that's also something that matters a lot. Sorry if I've been wrong. Very much, very much agree with you. Um, and, and definitely something that I want to dig in a little bit more to in, in the discussion, um, this, this question of uh, financing and, and how it's done. Um, I think, I, I think um, totally um, uh, agree that it's vital. But thank you very much for such a, a comprehensive um, overview of the risks and opportunities that you see. And I, in particular, enjoyed the way that you turned um, uh, uh, received wisdom on its head by saying that uh, the EU came, coming in, uh, came in too early with the European Green Deal. We normally talk about kind of the first mover advantage and so on and uh, the emblematic leadership power of that. But I think it's a really important point that, um, that you made about why it was um, that European leadership wasn't what it could have been um, at COP26. Um, I want to turn uh, next now um, to, um, to, to Gramaka, if I may. Um, uh, Gramaka, we've, uh, we've heard from, from, from Sebastian um, uh, uh, pointing towards um, some of the, the challenges that, um, that he sees uh, uh, in terms of uh, Europe-Africa relations at the moment. Uh, from from the, um, uh, the maps that I was uh, laying out at the beginning, we know that um, the Europe-Africa relationship is going to be absolutely critical from a European perspective. Um, in terms of uh, our ability to, to deliver on our promises, not just um, externally, but, um, but internally within the EU. Um, can, you, um, can you elaborate a little, say a few words on, um, on, from an African perspective, how the European Green Deal is seen um, and, and, and what you see as being sort of crucial next steps in terms of taking the partnership around climate forward? Sure. And uh, I'll thank Sebastian for being very thorough because he stole quite a lot of my thunder in his uh, presentation, but that's all right. Um, helps us move along to the question and answer. Um, ironically, there is quite a lot of alignment on what Europe is trying to achieve and what at least Africa is declaring through things like the Green Recovery Action Plan through the Agenda 2063. So we have at least our end goals when we look at Europe and Africa tend to be quite well aligned. Where it gets a bit more bogged down is how to get there, who's going to do what, and most importantly, how there's going to be this balance of the value chains. I think one of the things that is unfortunately misunderstood is exactly what, what Africa wants to do with its industrialization, which if we take the European Green Deal on the surface, is an industrial policy uh, for Europe. What Africa really wants is the jobs. Yes, it's a question of productivity. Yes, it's a question of market growth, but it's also a question of we just need to absorb all these young people that we all of a sudden have. And there it's really a question of what's the appropriate technology that we can use that is both green, that is clean, and that's kind of future-proof, but can actually absorb quite a large, and unfortunately, for the moment at least, an unskilled labor force. And this tends to lend itself more towards a kind of brown development trajectory we're trying to move away from. Uh, from an African perspective, I think the major issue of course, it's going to be finance, but it's also, as Sebastian said, this issue of trust. Part of that has been a failure to reach uh, self kind of claim targets, whether it's the ODA targets, whether it's the one, uh, 100 billion annual uh, climate financing targets, um, but also in the approach of how Europe has designed some of its announcements, some of its policies. This issue of how has Africa been engaged um, on, on the multilateral level versus the bilateral, who is doing it, and where Africa really actually has a kind of leeway to negotiate. Right now, what's really being presented is, you know, this is what Europe is going to do. It is the right solution. It is properly thought out. You will find a way to make it work for you. And oh, by the way, it's, it's in your best interest. All of that might be true, but the issue here is then a, it's, it's a principle of respect. And so if you feel disrespected and you're told, you know, this is for your own good, it is in your interest, you're already positioning people to be defensive because they have no ownership of it. And in this way, Europe is not helping itself because it's not helping the African Union in particular be a legitimate player when it comes to these kinds of international negotiations. And so one very important step is actually in Europe's engagement with Africa specifically, it needs to engage in a way that promotes or at least legitimizes the African Union, which is also struggling on the African continent to appear as the appropriate and competent uh, player, whether that's crisis management, whether that's negotiating at the international level. So there has to be a little bit of restraint on the European side and a better pacing in terms of getting inputs, in terms of the communication, in terms of the signaling. And I actually think there is a second opportunity for, the, for Europe to show this that's coming, 
with the European law on um, sustainable corporate governance. Because what you're going to see here in a very practical sense is due diligence across the entire value chain for anyone uh, who wants to import into Europe. And so, okay, this is going to help African uh, countries deal with European multinationals, but other multinationals as well, which has long been uh, a kind of tension point in international relations, particularly in trade, dating back to the 70s. Now Europe is effectively saying, we're gonna help you police these entities who have had positive impacts, but also to help negate the negative impacts that we know of. That should be very welcome, but it needs to be presented in a way that's not seen as, well, you're incapable of doing this, so we're gonna do it for you. So a lot of this is about the appearance and the legitimacy, and this is kind of performance of or this kind of performative part of it, rather than the substance, because on, on substance, at least in the documents that we see in the announcements that we have, there is a lot of alignment. Um, Barring the question of financing and then a second question around justice, particularly on the loss and damage, which was another major fallout point at COP26, everything else appears in line. And then it's a question of to what extent will Europe, put it very bluntly, will Europe allow Africa to own the value chains, particularly in energy, uh, that enable the green transition? So we don't want to turn this idea of uh, fortress Europe into kind of a green fortress Europe. That's something that Africa absolutely wants to avoid. And so it will need help and it will need time and support to shift its own internal structures, which is part of its aspiration anyway, so that it's not just an export oriented and actually use both the post COVID recovery, but then all the future kind of industrial planning and financing to fundamentally transform African economies. Like the, the task is massive. To put it in really simple terms, you know, Europe is moving from I don't like to use this kind of imagery, but it's moving from kind of position one to position two. And so it's a transition. Whereas Africa was approaching position one and is now being asked to divert and go straight to position two. You know, so all of that that goes into position one is invisible. We could put that under loss and damages. Some of it is mitigation adaptation. But then there's all the questions around what resources are required, what technical expertise is required, what technologies are required. And in this area, although Europe is very ambitious, you do see a lot of global leadership in other places, notably China. So they dominate in renewables, both for rare earth minerals, but also for quite a, a lot of the technology, the investments and so on. So globally, they're the largest investor in this area. And, and this is something that Europe needs to come to terms with and tackle. Uh, and finally, the, the last point is, I mean, particularly with Global Gateway, Position, the, the positioning has now been that this is an alternative to China. And I think this is a really poor framing because China has dominated the kind of narrative of being the alternative to the West. So if you're the alternative to the alternative, you're really coming from a position of kind of defensiveness and weakness rather than projection and progressiveness. This I think is a, is a quick shift, but an important one that needs to be done. Uh, the rest I'll, I'll leave for the question and answer. But thank you very much. Thank you very much um, indeed, uh, Gwamaka. Re really uh, in important points. I wanted to um, kind of dig into a couple of issues that, that you've raised um, uh, straight away. Firstly, um, on the kind of um, the, the sort of the broader trust issue, you talked about the fact that um, the European Green Deal is, um, is primarily uh, seen as an industrial policy um, uh, for, from an African perspective and about um, uh, the, the sort of the primacy of uh, competitiveness of European businesses um, above and beyond the sort of uh, the, uh, the, the climate goals within it. Um, you, do you see a place um, for a kind of a shift in narrative um, from a European point of view being, being helpful within this about the fact that, um, of course, it's not only about kind of what is in everybody's um, uh, interest uh, in, in, in terms of uh, the need to transition away from carbon. It is also um, a reality that Europe, like all other regions, um, are thinking about how they can compete in, in that environment as well. Do you, do you think that would be helpful um, to deal with this, um, this trust issue that you've mentioned? And then um, I couldn't um, help but pick up on, uh, you picked up on, um, the, sorry, you, you raised the point about um, sort of different models um, being uh, put forward uh, by, by China. And I just wanted to um, put uh, up for, for all of us to look at this, this final map um, uh, that, that, that comes from our Power Atlas chapter, which, which kind of shows the, the different types of um, 
uh, of climate financing that are coming flows that are coming from different um, regions of the world. And, and we can see very clearly that although um, Europe is uh, Western Europe is providing more than um, the US and Canada um, in terms of climate finance, this is dwarfed in comparison to what is coming um, uh, from East Asia and the Pacific. Um, and so I would be interested in, um, in, in both of your, your, your views on you know, what, what we need to do um, uh, uh, in terms of, uh, you know, and particularly ahead of COP27 uh, about the, the climate finance question to show, um, A, that we are kind of starting to put in place the mechanisms, create the environment that is needed to mobilize more private um, finance, uh, but also that we're not, um, you know, can, can we continue to sort of shirk the question of public finance um, on this, and particularly given um, how disproportionate uh, the, the contributions are? So, um, yeah, uh, I don't know, Grandma, could you want to react to that first, and then we go to Sebastian, or? Uh, sure. On the first question, if I understood correctly on the, on the trust issue, I think, yes, it would help, but it does open up several other questions that kind of detract from this being a Europe policy and then looking at its more kind of global implications. And I think Global Gateway, at least so far, hasn't addressed them yet. And that may be why we have this problem. So on the one hand, there is an extraterritoriality to the European Green Deal, which is where some of the problems come up. So this idea of CBAM is one, the corporate government, the sustainable corporate governance would be another. Um, but it's this kind of sense that Europe has made a decision and it has an impact way beyond its borders that requires it to have you know, presented that, negotiated that in a better way. It's fine if the European Green Deal is an aspirational document, the way you see in Africa with all these visions and so on. But if it becomes legally binding in that sense, then you feel like it's an imposition. Um, the second problem that comes up with that is if you then start to present this as, yes, it's an economic imperative. Yes, this is you know, a moral issue as well. You then get into a, a really messy discussion coming back to the kind of loss and damage. So it's good that we have these steps to go forward, but it doesn't address how we got here to begin with, which is measurable, which we can then put a price on. And although no one wants to really get into discussion of, around reparations, that's going to be one of the questions that the African countries have where they say, this is not a problem of our making. You know, there is an element of accountability and responsibility that is being overlooked and being ignored. And we can't be, can't be having that. Um, the other signal that becomes a bit worrying um, from an African perspective is, you know, the appearance or at least the, the quick mobilization of funds for the COVID situation show that where there is a political will, money will appear. And so when it's framed as we're going to leverage all this and open up the private sector and, 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 and get more money flowing, those are great aspirations, they're great ideas, but there's nothing concrete to say this will work. And yet, we have a very recent example of when there was a crisis, suddenly funding was available on a scale that, in, at least in the development context, has always been framed as, no, that's very difficult to get to, it's not going to be politically feasible, and so on. So part of that's going to be an internal discussion about why the partnership with Africa is so important and why generosity, to be frank, is in the interest of Europe in implementing and achieving its own goals, um, but why also it was one situation to deal with it in crisis, we have to look at climate not as something that is European, but something that is global, and we have a shared responsibility, and we, by the way, not only got us here, but we have the means to deal with it. If this collapses elsewhere, and we know particularly the Sahel and in the south of, south of Africa, two of the kind of belts which are very vulnerable, the third being this kind of Syria to Pakistan stretch, that will have implications for Europe, both from a peace and security perspective, from a trade perspective. Um, and that also then comes to the question of migration, the question of looking to Europe for leadership is one, but it's also going to be Europe becomes a haven. And what do you, what do, you do in that context if migration theoretically um, were to ramp up even more? So there's a, lot, there's a lot to unpack, both on the financing side and on whether or not this is an industrial policy. But as I said, a lot of this is aligned with what other people are trying to do. It's really a question of the mechanism and allowing other people to have an ownership on what is presented as a European agenda, but is actually a global one. 
Thanks very much indeed. Um, Sebastian, any reactions uh, from your side on, on any of these issues? Yes, th th thanks a lot. And, and I think on the uh, issue of the 100 billion that, that you put on the table about climate finance, can we go there by mobilizing more private finance? I think um, what I think is very important is to uh, try and translate, <clears throat> try and translate the, the projections that have been produced by the OECD into something that is a little bit credible. So there is something that can be done about just being a little bit more accountable for reaching the 100 billion of fin climate finance, uh, at least in 2023 or something like that. So, so, so this is about accountability to some extent. But a lot of the colleagues that we, with whom we discuss, not just in, uh, but in Latin America and Africa, are also telling us. It's fine, this is very important money, but actually what also matters a lot is the structural asymmetry in the global uh, trade system. So, uh, okay, we need that money, that's right, and you need to be accountable on your promises, but it, it's not, uh, we, trust is also about what you do on, on, on the trade relations. I want just to mention that on the forum on cooperation between China and Africa, very uh, interestingly, China said, OK, infrastructure is not the main point. Now it's trade. It's about investing in your countries. And that's just emphasizing a lot what Wamaka was saying, that Europe is now saying, but we have TGI, we have Global Gateway. But China is already on. I, I'm just speaking about narratives, huh? but narratives do matter. On narrative, China is already one step ahead, uh, saying we know that what matters is not so. Infrastructures are important, but we need to install the right trade relations. And there are, for instance, targets at the discussed in this forum about how much is China going to import from uh, green uh, agriculture, green lanes, I think green agricultural corridors from Africa. And those types of targets from China are quite innovative. I mean, from Europe, we could say that we already had that with ACP, but that's not the same. It's, uh, it's, uh, I think uh, China is one step ahead in terms of political narrative, definitely. Uh, <clears throat> and the other element beyond the, the, the issue of the of climate finance uh, is the issue of what we that what the European countries <clears throat> in G7 and G20 are going to be able to push for the, the discussion on special drawing rights uh, at IMF. I think that's basically the important money that could flow into uh, these developed countries for their recovery, and that matters more. The only thing is that it, if on top of that you don't you are not there on the numbers on climate finance, then it's even worse. But what matters are those uh, those important numbers, and I completely concur with uh, Guamaka that there is a key issue on loss and damage, uh, where I believe that the European member states have now completely understood that the the moral and political uh, inevitability of the concept, and they are extremely worried about the amount of money that could be at stake. Uh, and so I don't. I mean, I see that we are going to try and as as. Paris-based think tank to try and organize a, a European conversation on that with other colleagues in Germany at least, to see how maybe Germany in G7 context with Indonesia in the G20 presidency could a little bit advance that discussion in, towards something that could be practicable, because we were, were not going to avoid it. This needs to be put on the table, but and it will sound like reparations, like war reparations, but that's there is something behind that, uh, that that is justified. So how can we go forward without just scaring um, uh, something that would be uh, just impossible to to negotiate with the finance ministries in our countries? And, and, and I think that's that's an important point. Even if in, in the amounts, I mean, the real amounts of money that will be transferred in the years to come, it might be small, but politically it matters a lot. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm, I don't think there are any questions in the Q&A box unless I'm reading that tool wrongly, in which case I hope that one of my colleagues will just flag that to me and uh, I apologise if I'm ignoring anyone. So I'm just going to keep going um, with my questions because um, I'm finding this uh, discussion very interesting. But just to reiterate, if people want to um, to write anything, do feel free to, to, to put it in the Q&A box and um, we'll try and address it. I wanted to talk um, next uh, about tech. I think both of you have alluded um, separately to, to the global gateway and um, uh, some of the aspects of, of, of tech within this, but I'm really interested in your views. Um, uh, I, have, I have mine, um, uh, but I want to test them. Um, as to the extent to which um, Europeans are kind of prepared um, uh, to, to take a certain amount of, um, uh, to take a certain amount of uh, a, a trade off on on green tech in order um to ensure uh that uh, that, that, that there is a, um, a more productive diffusion um uh, of the technology which is needed uh, for for the transition 
are we, for example, um, as, as Europeans, in an environment where we know that we're playing a kind of a catch up game with both the China, with China and the US um, on tech more broadly, are we prepared to think about um, initiatives like uh, 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 facilities for co-innovation, um, uh, to, uh, to, 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 to work more in, in the sort of the buildup of the kind of tech that we need in partnerships, which is in the interest of both the economic development of, of partner countries, but also our own interests um, in, 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 in terms of getting access um, to the types of technologies um, that we will need? Or is this one of those areas where um, uh, sort of European ambitions to lead um, uh, kind of clash uh, when, when, it, when, it was sort of, when we look at the economic dimension and, and the climate dimension? And then I was also interested as well, um, uh, both of you uh, have referred to in, in a different way uh, of the, the sort of the divisions that there are in place between, um, uh, and, and this is, I think, in a large part driven by the different perspectives between OECD countries and the developing world around the climate agenda. Uh, in that context, how useful an idea is the, is the Climate Club initiative that's been driven by the, uh, the German government in the European context was looked at um, uh, COP26, and I think we can expect to be um, uh, pushed forward uh, in the German presidency of, of, of the G7. Is, is, is this something which will kind of just uh, entrench the, the, the perception of us and them around this, or, or can this be a sort of a useful tool um, uh, in these partnerships? I give that, uh, put those two questions over to you, and then I can see that um, we've triggered some activity in the Q&A, so I'll, I'll, I'll read that. <laughs> you're responding. Who would like to go first? I can go if uh, go Thank you. Yes. Thank you. No, I, I mean, on tech, this is, I mean, w when we looked at, in Europe at how the uh, photovoltaics uh, was actually uh, uh, not going to be anything that developed in, in, in China, uh, we also looked at the, the where is the value and where are the jobs in the transition to photovoltaics. And some of the jobs are actually in installing uh, rather than in producing the tech. So. I just want to, I'm, I'm not sure I have a proper answer to your question, but I believe it's important to know that it's not just producing the technologies that captures the values and the job, it's a little bit more complicated. And I think that the access to technology is probably not the main point uh, if I look at uh, least developed countries in Africa or elsewhere. Uh, so it's not just about trying to release uh, uh, the, uh, the, the intellectual property rights. A lot of the discussion is about, is about how you access investments, how you have uh, enough trust into uh, building the right types of business model to, for these technologies to be uh, deployed and uh, deploying also their profitability in the countries uh, that, that are at stake. So I'm, I'm, it might be a little bit too general, but I think I would not emphasize too much the IPR discussion, not to say that uh, it's, it's okay, we can just uh, uh, make our money on, 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 on IPR. I'm just saying that it's probably not the blocking factor. Uh, and, and we need to really, I think, uh, work also on uh, uh, other types of innovations that are less technological uh, on, on business model, on the services of electricity access for Africa in a non-centralized manner, where we can actually exchange a lot between Europe and, and, and Africa, uh, given the, the, the different models that we have in Europe on that. On the Climate Club initiative, just to mention that France is extremely worried about that because they, France sees that as an alternative proposal to CBAM. Uh, from a purely conceptual point of view at IDRI, we would be much more interested by the Climate Club Initiative as such, which is about we, when two countries want to have an ambitious transformation to climate to carbon neutrality, how can they negotiate their trade relations in a way that is accelerating their transformation rather than impairing it? And that's conceptually exactly what we would think to, it would be the right way to look at the regulation of globalization from now. And, and I believe the, 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 the pitfall that you are mentioning is extremely important. Who are the us and who are the them in this, in this discussion? I believe that in that case, Germany would need to make a big job in, in working with the uh, Indonesian presidency of the G20 to, to foster that in order for not just having Europe being the club 
and all the progressive countries being OECD and the rest of the world being the non-progressive one. There are lots of southern countries where ambition is important and being able to strike a trade deal, uh, I mean, not a trade deal, but preparing trade relations between Indonesia and Malaysia on one hand and Europe, for instance, on deforestation, that would be an incarnation of the club, Climate Club initiative that would be extremely well positioned and in a moment where Indonesia and Malaysia are extremely worried by the, the strategy by Europe to uh, on, on avoiding the deforestation, imported deforestation. So making it um, tangible in that type of relations would I think may be very important to show who are the who can be participating in the club and what how it's functioning. Thank you very much indeed. Um, uh, Gwamaka, your, your reactions to these points, and maybe I can throw into your mix this time around one of the questions that's come up in the Q&A box about what you think would be a good outcome from the EU-AU summit in February if it happens. Um, and maybe I would kind of just add in the words good and realistic, um, what you think is possible. <laughs> um, I, I wanted to add on, on something Sebastian said about the, the tech transfer. Um, one of the things that is extremely valuable for the African countries in particular is comes through local content policies. So for example, natural gas investments are not just attractive because, hey, you have gas, you're a gas country, there's a lot of money involved. But it's actually, there's a lot of spin-off industries that come from the gas industry that are local, that need upgrading to become internationally competitive. Um, and that then allows them to transfer those into other areas. So for example, uh, iron works, um, the creation of the pipes, the kind of advanced engineering that goes into building and maintaining a gas operation or a gas economy can move into automotive manufacturing and so on. And so quite, what is attractive about a gas plant as such is not just the investment in and of itself and the direct and indirect jobs it creates, is to what are the other knock-on value additions that it creates for other industries, whether fledgling or established, to raise their quality standard to, to an internationally competitive level. Um, and that's something that is very often overlooked. So it's not just a question of the number of jobs created by that investment. It's also about the, the tech transfer that goes into these supportive industries um, that need to be looked at. And so gas is always a very good example because it's very clear, it's a known model. Whereas with something like solar panels, Africa is not going to you know, be able to produce solar panels competitively versus China. That's not going to happen. And so from an African perspective, you worry that, okay, we have this advantage, we have loads of sunshine, but we're just trading dependencies. If we become dependent on China for solar panels, how is that any different from the situation we're in now? Um, and so, you know, would you allow Africa to protect its markets? Then you could get into all these, uh, the, the, these kinds of questions. I do want to just add a slight diversion uh, to come back to the, the, the points on China. One thing that will change when it comes to China is when it finally does become a, a quote unquote rich country in a few years time, sometime in the next two, three years, the rules for China change too. Uh, and you're already starting to see that change in its rhetoric. Part of that is the ramping up of discussion around trade. Yes, they've burnt the fingers, but it's also the rules apply differently to them at that point. Um, and also the impact that Chinese investments have had on African governance systems has actually been positive if you're from a European perspective. Yes, it does prop up a lot of states that Europe is a bit uncomfortable with, but what it has pushed is the accountability for the investments or for the trade agreements back to the African governments. The Chinese are very strong in saying, look, we come here to barter. We have an agreement. We asked you to name your price. You negotiated a deal you're not happy with. That's not on us, which is a different relationship to the one Africa has traditionally had with notably Europe, but also the US where the terms or the conditionalities as they've been referred to have kind of been, well, we can blame the Europeans or blame the Americans because they made us do it this way. The Chinese don't give the African leadership that option. And so there, there has been this benefit to, at least from a governance perspective, indirectly, I like to think anyway, where yes, it materially is hurting Africa, but in terms of moving the agenda on governance and improving governance systems, it might actually be helpful. And I think China as well is coming to the realization that that's becoming very tricky for it. Increasingly, the investment deals that it's striking are becoming more and more scrutinized from Africans themselves. So the international pressure has been helpful, but now it's grassroots. And that's a very different political issue for them to deal with. Um, on a positive outcome at the <laughs> African Union Summit, I, I think if you could start to restore the normalcy 
around the discussions on climate on relations between the two continents. That would be a very, I think that's realistic and a very good first step. I don't anticipate, you know, a formal agreement, a massive announcement that everything's going to be fine leading up to COP26 because we know, uh, 27, sorry, we know that finance is going to be one of the key points of, of COP27. So they, there might be some minor you know, steps taken in that direction of recognition, as you said, um, around the importance of, of loss and damage. I, I think that a positive step would actually, from an African perspective, maybe be that Europe seeds the ground a little bit and says, okay, we acted hastily, but we genuinely do want to listen and actually takes that on board. I think as I mentioned earlier, I think from the African perspective, there is a question of the AU as a legitimate actor, but it's also that th there's this respect issue that doesn't seem to evolve. And, and from strictly speaking, from a popular African understanding, it's a sense of here we go again. You know, we're not, it's the same pattern, that it's the same consultations that are taken as, as absolutes, and then the adaptation is, is pushed locally. And so for African politicians, particularly those now engaging at the border between the international and, and, and national, essentially these are not grassroots agendas that they're taking from their people upwards. These are top down. They've not been elected to implement these. And so they have a selling job to do domestically and they're not being helped by a sense that this is being imposed. It's one thing that it comes from an Africa wide, we're in this together. It's a whole other thing that this is Africa's partner telling Africa to make this Africa wide. That's a very difficult political sell. Um, and we've seen that particularly in climate, a lot of the African political champions on climate are having to do a lot of work domestically to justify why they're going around, you know, around the world talking about climate. Yeah. So a, a positive outcome would be a recognition that the, there are very specific challenges that Europe needs to understand and respect in Africa and maybe do more to understand the aspirations and where they come from and try to then create a better alignment, even if it's just in terms of the narrative on why the European Green Deal and what Europe is offering aligns already with what Africa has said it wants to do, rather than necessarily appearing that, look, here's Europe great, wants to be the world leader in the first continent to be carbon neutral, instead presenting it as you know, we're aligned with what you want to do too. We, we're starting from different places, but we want to achieve the same things. We have a lot of what you need. You have a lot of what we will need. Let's find a way to make this work. I think if there's a, just a change in tone, that's already a very positive step. And I think that's realistic. Ideally, I'd like to see loads of cash, but you know, that's not necessarily <laughs> what we're going to see. Well, I mean, maybe we can come back on that question uh, with regards to COP27 as well. But I think um, uh, it's a great answer. And I think it deals with the question that Melissa Westphal has put in, in the box about how the EU can kind of con concretely win on the narrative. Um, I think uh, that, that's really important that you've raised. Unfortunately, the questions in the box, it's a bit like we say in London about the number 11 bus, that none of them come and then they all come at once. We've got a great set of questions now. So what I'm going to do is um, offer them up to you all, um, to, to you both um, as, as sort of uh, your, your wrap up comments and give you three minutes each on whichever ones you want to answer. We've got kind of two more um, looks back at the, the climate finance questions in different ways. Firstly, um, do you think this is going to be, be the reason that the whole um, consensus uh, at, unravels at COP27? Um, or do you see um, any kind of uh, chinks of light uh, on, on this front? Um, and then uh, maybe if either of you have thoughts on um, sort of whether more could be made of the cost effectiveness argument of um, greater bang for your buck um, in, in investing uh, in African um, LDCs, uh, as opposed to um, euros spent in green investments in Germany and France. Um, if either of you want to pick up the question on CAP, I'm very interested in, in that. Um, what further reforms of CAP? Um, uh, obviously, you need to answer this within about one minute are needed to promote climate change goals um, and open up trade opportunities um, for ACP countries. And then a question on how you imagine trade between um, Europe and Africa being impacted by climate change. I think this question is kind of getting at sort of the, the impact of climate change rather than climate change measures like CBAM. So, um, yeah, please take your pick um, on, on whichever of those you'd like to dig into. Sebastian, if you'd like to take your three minutes first. And I hope Thanks people so won't much. mind us running slightly over as we slide, started slightly late. Thanks a lot. I'll try to be quick. And I, 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 I must say, I don't have an answer on the uh, on the scenarios of how future, future climate change impacts are going to change the trade patterns. You have studies about agriculture that are there, but I believe uh, 
uh, it's not enough to really open the, I think we should, as, as Wamaka was saying, we need to, uh, uh, before doing those studies in Europe, we should actually look at what are the expected trade lanes from uh, Africa to Europe for the industrialization of Africa, and then think what is the uh, climate knowledge that we need, because go, go, going directly to how uh, climate change uh, is going to impact uh, cotton is not the right way around. We need to think uh, from the from the needs. And I just wanted to say basically that I completely concur with Guamaca that my expectation would be that at least the summit in February enables to launch a new way of dialogue. Again, I've said that to the French Minister of, of uh, Foreign Affairs. It's, it's a summit that is perceived as not having consulted enough uh, the African counterparts. And we are even fearing that it's going to be not, a, that it's not going to be attended by a lot of uh, heads of states. I have no info on that. I'm just fearing that it might end up this way. Uh, and so basically, the last point that I wanted to say in terms of a, uh, a conclusion or the, I, I think really, uh, I, I, I like the way that Gomaka was saying that we, we should not uh, uh, think of uh, China as being the bad guy when we are in Europe. I'm not saying that we don't need to look at uh, the rivalry geopolitically and economically. There are things where we are competing or conflicting, but there are lots of things that we can do together in the way that we can improve the relation in third countries. And to some extent, I see also uh, a lot of the discussions we had after COP26 where the G77 without China was already having their own messages, not blurred too much by the very specific position of China being still a developing country while being very rich. And I think it, it, this is not good for Europe because it divides the, the alliance between G77 and China. This is not the gain that I see. It should that it enables clarity about what the other part of the world is claiming of, of, as their needs. And I hope that this clarification, we need to ask think tanks to help it uh, uh, be constructive rather than just uh, strategically used. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Bamaka, last uh, word goes to you then, your two or three minutes to wrap this all together. I'll try to be quick so that you can have the last word because I'm not going to touch cap and you seem very eager to. Um, very quickly, I actually don't think climate finance will be the breaking point for this um, for the kind of consensus, but it will limit what can be achieved massively. So I don't think anyone has an interest in walking away from the table, but at least understanding that the table is is limited. Uh, on the on the question of of kind of bang for your buck, I guess you could look at the short term political gains versus the longer term global impacts that would split the two. But uh, the IEA actually had a report earlier, well, now in, in, in 2021, where they argue that really we need to focus on particularly emerging economies that are this kind of middle point, because that's actually where you're going to see the biggest growth of future emissions. And it's cheaper to prevent that from happening than it is from dealing with it once it's there. Uh, so in that sense, maybe that answers the question that you are probably better off. I don't have the, the numbers for that, but uh, I'm sure that this, this report- We can reference the IEA report. Yeah, very, yeah. The very, um, in terms of trade lanes, very quickly, I mean, we're already starting to see that these are changing because of climate change, so opening up the Arctic during certain months that could divert certain traffic. Um, but more specifically, from a European security perspective, you will likely see more trade lanes with Africa opening up just as a matter of practice for diversifying or geographically diversifying its sources of materials and where it's going to have manufacturing. Part of this is linked to nearshoring, but part of this is a response to the global vulnerability of value chains that we saw really come to the fore during COVID-19 and the already over-dependence, we could make an argument for, uh, on China. One final point on, on trade. I mean, there's, there's this question around getting all these agreements to fit WTO, but there's, I think, also a valid question about getting the WTO to fit these new aspirations because it was designed in an era that was very different. Um, and so the question might not be, how do we get these to fit to the rules that exist? But maybe a, a question around changing the rules so that they actually enable us to do the kinds of things we A, want to do and B, need to do. Uh, and on that note, thank you very much. And I will leave you to deal with GAP. <laughs> I'm not even going to try, given that we've gone over time. Um, but uh, uh, I think what we can safely say is that uh, we've touched on a huge uh, range of issues and uh, there's lots more uh, to discuss. So um, let's let's continue the conversation. I'd like to thank you both for um, being such willing participants and um, being so generous in, in your thoughts and, and, and your insights that you shared today and to thank everybody 
uh, for bearing with me having run over slightly um, in my poor moderation, um, but I felt that it was worth it um, in order to deal with um, some of the great questions which, uh, which participants sent in. So thank you all very much and look forward to um, seeing how many of our predictions today turn out to be true at the EU-AU Summit and beyond. <laughs> Thanks a lot, everyone. Thank you, bye-bye.